someone had entered the bedroom, fired bullets into the two victims, and he set the house on fire. This really isn't the kind of crime that you see in small towns. It's an execution. In the three years leading up to their death, the Kalishnik house had been in, like, a lot of legal disputes. He said Greg talked about hiring a hitman to take care of the Kalishnik house. Our question isn't who had motive, because a lot of people had motive. He had 26 eviction lawsuits that he had filed. This is about which one of them did it. Cookville is like a college town. And it's close enough to Nashville that there's, you know, stuff going on. You've got access to culture and art. A little bit urban and a little bit, a little bit country. You got a bunch of good old country folks. Um, I mean, I can say that my family is. Shoot your gun when you want, play music where you want, drive off the road where you want. What's really beautiful about this area is that it is the heartland of America. You know, you could come here with whatever dream you have and with hard work, you know, the dreams are realized. You see a lot of that in Tennessee. In the case that we're looking into here, different people in this community all had big dreams and some of them went horribly wrong. Victor Kalisnikow and his wife Ala were a couple from the Ukraine and the community members here referred to them as the foreigners or the Germans or the Russians. You know, nobody could quite put their finger on what their background was. They retired here and it was their American dream and they started working in real estate and really saw the potential in a beautiful place like this. Fought in 1998. The Kalishnikows were murdered here in Cookville and to this day, there are a number of people in the community who still feel like justice hasn't been served. Number one. Yes. I live out on Poplar Grove Road. Yes. There's a house on fire. The call come in from a neighbor across the street. The fire department arrived. At that time, there was no indication that anybody was in the house. There's nobody stirring about. I'm going to make its way to the house right quick. I can't get close enough to the house to check. Uh, i got power lines uh, fixing to fall off the house here. It's fully involved. I can't hardly get close enough for it. By the time the fire was suppressed, the house suffered massive damage. Local departmental investigators called for assistance from the state fire marshal's office. I was one of the first team members to arrive. The skeletal remains of the house are still smoldering from a fire that started around 3.30 a.m. Wednesday morning. State fire marshal investigators sift through the ashes looking for clues. We entered into the house. There was massive damage. The roof over the bedroom was completely burned away. And there were two bodies on the bed. Both people were dead from gunshot wounds. We recovered several nine millimeter uh, rounds from in and around the body. An accelerant had been poured in the room and the house had set on fire. This was no random fire. This was intentional to cover up the murders. My name is Linda Bowsman. At the time of the murders, I was judicial assistant for an appellate court judge. When law enforcement spoke with the neighbors, they didn't know much. No one saw a person there. There really wasn't much for law enforcement to go on. Working in a small town in law enforcement. Everybody knows everybody, everybody knows everybody's business. You know, our job was just to, to dig up 
the facts that we could find. Like a lot of small town murders, this case didn't get a lot of national attention. The only person who really covered it extensively was Rabia Chowdhury with her podcast, Undisclosed. I really hope Rabia can give us a framework for understanding this very complex small town case. Hello? Hi. Hi, Hillary. Hi, Rabia. How are you? Good. How are you? Nice to meet you. You did so much research. So what can you tell us about this case? It was a pretty horrifying crime, the way they were killed. The house was set on fire. I mean, it it caught, you know, the the attention of the TBI. They got involved, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. They were the lead on this case. What was the immediate response from investigators the morning of the fire? One of the first people they talked to was Victor's sister. And the first thing she told them was that he um, was in the process of suing this guy named Greg Lance. Greg bought a trailer park from Victor as a, as a direct buy. Greg Lance purchased the property from Victor and Alla, and they loaned him like $375,000. At the time of the murders, Victor was in the process of foreclosing on the trailer park for unpaid taxes, and Greg was challenging it in court. Two days prior to the hearing is when the murders happened. At this point, law enforcement believes that the trailer park was a motive for the murders of the Kalisnikows. The morning of the murders, the investigators start looking at the trailer park that Victor Kalisnikow had sold to Greg Lance. At this trailer park, there's a house at the entrance where Greg lives with his girlfriend Becky his friend, and the property manager, Keith, and Keith's girlfriend, Kay. I'm Kay Sanders, and I'm a friend of Greg Lance's. That trailer park was like living in a totally different land. They were like their own little family. They all would get together and talk about each other. Most of these people were struggling and doing the best that they could. A lot of people would call it the slums of Cookville. And I know Greg was always working hard at trying to improve the look of the trailer park. Greg was about 26, 27. I was shocked that he owned the trailer park because he was so young. Keith Herbstruth worked for Greg Lance. He ran the trailer park for him. Keith and Greg were really good friends. Cops showed up and wanting to talk to everybody. A man comes over and talks to Greg and Keith and lets them know that Mr. and Mrs. Kalishnikov had been murdered. Bob Kropsik was running the investigation. He was the TBI agent. He went through Greg's room. He was going through the house, and they were just pulling drawers out and going through everything. Greg let them search the house. There was nothing in the house, no evidence. There was just nothing there. They asked Greg where he was on the night of the murders. And Greg was out at Happy Days Bar. He came home about 1 o'clock, and he and Becky went to bed. And Becky was able to verify Greg's alibi. An hour or two later, Bob Krawczyk was telling us not to leave town. We were all scared. So after this whole day of questioning Greg and everyone else surrounding him in the trailer park, investigators are not able to piece together anything. There's nothing connecting Greg to the crime at all. Not a witness, not forensics, nothing. But Rabia, was there anybody else who was also having financial difficulty with Victor? Oh, definitely. Victor was very litigious. I mean, I know at the time of his death, he had 26 outstanding like eviction lawsuits that he had filed against tenants. That's a lot of people in his orbit that all yeah. need to be looked at. Yeah. Victor and Ella would do these rent-to-buy options with tenants, mm-hmm. and then they would find a reason to renege on the contract to get the property back. So it could have been any number of people who were angry with the Kalishnikovs. 
We're heading over to meet up with Linda Bozeman, who is a really cool woman. She had been a judicial assistant in the courts and dug up information that no one else had been able to find. She, more than anybody, has a really firm grasp on the details of this case and a lot of knowledge about where things might have gone wrong. I, I can't even imagine, like, tackling this without all of the work that you have done. Because it's so much. There's a lot here, and there's so many layers. I think it was about 2002 when I became involved in the case. And then it became an obsession. And I was so determined that I was going to solve this puzzle. Talk to me a little bit about what happened at the Kalishnikau house. Mm -hmm. Early on. Yeah. They had no real clue of who had committed the murders. If they had known, they would have made an arrest. Yeah. Cookville's a small town. A lot of people here are related to each other. A lot of gossip here about what went on during that time period. A lot of things being told around in the trailer park that may or may not be true. There's a rumor every two feet. You know, we followed the leads that were presented to us. You know, some of them are just outlandish. There was discussion of the Russian mafia and, and that uh, somebody followed up on it and it went nowhere. A couple weeks had passed and there was no evidence of any kind that indicated who had done the murders. There was nothing. They don't find a murder weapon or any evidence. Nothing. There doesn't seem to be any forward momentum. And then the governor of Tennessee offered a reward. And so when that reward gets announced, what's the next thing that happens? The day that the reward was announced, some people called law enforcement and told them that they had heard shooting at one of their neighbor's farms the weekend before the murders. The farm was empty and they were concerned. They told the TBI that they had walked the property over there, had gone up into the barn, and that there were two military-type gas cans. They said that the day before the murders, the gas cans were still there in the barn, but that the day of the murders, they were gone. This farm was owned by Mike Heron, a friend of Greg's. And Greg Lance is the guy buying the trailer park from Victor Kalishnikov. Our team was activated along with several investigators from the sheriff's office and TBI. We responded out to the farm and we conducted a search of the farm. My primary responsibility was in around the shed. Some of the things we noted was there was a fresh area of the wall that had just been randomly cut out. It stood out like a sore thumb. I was born and raised on a farm, live on a farm now, and I can think of no reason to just go cut a hole in my, in my barn. And it appeared that the wall, somebody had tried to set it on fire. That rung everybody's bell. We found this little fire pit, which was right outside of the building where that hole was cut, and we sifted the debris. We found in and around there, multiple shell casings and bullets. Most of the bullets were, were nine millimeter. They were sent to the lab and linked to the murder scene. The murder weapon was fired at both locations. My opinion is that target practice was done with the murder weapon at the farm in preparation for committing a murder. And they used fire to obscure any evidence of target practice. So at this point, law enforcement was focusing on Greg, and they spoke to an individual who said that he saw Greg on the farm target practicing. On August 2nd, the day that there's gunfire at the uh -huh. Heron Farm. Right. And they matched bullets found at the Heron Farm mm -hmm. to the crime scene. Yes. That looks really bad for Greg. Up until this point, there was no firearm recovered in the case. There, they had no real suspects, although they were looking at Greg. 
September 17th, not too far from the crime scene, uh, a weapon was recovered in a ditch. The weapon was a Tech 9, 9mm, but now with the flashlight taped to it, it is outfitted for a tactical environment, nighttime operations. It's not a farm gun. No. You know what I mean? It's like a gun that's only meant to kill people. It's more like, right. It's like an automatic weapon. Right, an assault weapon. The weapon was sent to the lab. Each weapon will leave unique marks. Bullets that were fired at the farm and fired at the house when the murder occurred were fired through that weapon. Keith Herbstrith, the manager of the trailer park, and Greg's friend was brought in for questioning. They showed him a picture of the gun and the rope that was on the gun. When investigators show Keith this, what does Keith tell investigators? Keith said that he recognized the green cord on the gun, that this was the same cord that he and Greg had used to tie firecrackers up with on the 4th of July. From the photos, it looked like there were black smudges on the cord, and so Keith thought that the cord on the gun or the cord that they tied the firecrackers, that they were one in the same. So Keith says that cord belonged to Greg. Those black smudges are because of our fireworks. Right. Seems like we've connected them to the murder weapon. Right. From that point on, that's who they focused on, and they never looked around to anyone else. Bob Kropsick was running the investigation. I recall he pretty well told me that he knew that Greg had killed these people. He took Keith and I down at the Waffle House. Keith made the statement that Greg said that he was not going to win the case against the Kluzhnikovs and that he thought he was going to have to do away with them. I couldn't believe that Keith was making statements against Greg because I always thought they were pretty much like brothers. When they arrested Greg, it was heartbreaking and terrifying. My name is Joyce Argo. I'm Greg Lance's mother. Greg was uh, an ambitious young man. He went to the National Guard, and from there he was able to get a VA loan and buy property. He did very well with it. He also became a contractor. Greg was in construction. He married Becky. They had a daughter. He was anxious to live his life. When they brought him into the courthouse and his hands chained, it became a real, it became real, very real fast. Unless you have actually experienced it with your own child, I don't think you can understand the hurt of seeing it, seeing your son in chains. <laughs> I'm sorry. The evidence they have against him. Can you walk me through that? When the trial began, prosecution's theory of the case is that Greg killed the Kolesnikows in order to be able to keep the trailer park. Keith testified against Greg that Greg is upset over the foreclosure and that Greg talked to him about hiring a hitman to take care of the ballistic house. So Keith rolls on Greg. The next person that talks about Greg is who? Rocky Harmon. Okay. And Greg's lifelong friend. That's a tough blow. That's a tough blow. He said Greg and he talked about Rocky hiring a hitman. They also talked to... Mike Snow. Mike Snow testified that Greg tried to get 
him to hire someone to kill the Kalisna cows. He said that when Mike told him that it would take 10000 Greg said, I'm not paying $10,000. And then who do we have? Eric Tanner. Eric's testimony was that Greg talked to him about getting a gun, an untraceable gun. Okay. That looks bad? It looks bad. The evidence they have against him is the testimony of... The four individuals? Yeah. A connection to a nylon cord. Shooting practice at the Heron farm. Mm -hmm. It's very circumstantial. The closing argument of the prosecutor. He said, when you have one coincidence, okay. When you've got two... It starts to get a little strange. When you've got three and four, Mm -hmm. that's when they're no longer coincidences. Mm -hmm. When the trial was over and the jury was called back in, I couldn't believe my ears when they said that he was guilty. It was like the breath was just mashed out of me. Greg is sentenced to two life sentences. Right now, we are meeting up with Greg Lance's mom, Joyce, who has been his like biggest advocate. And so I'm really eager to hear what she has to say. Hi. Hey. I want you to see this first, our beautiful courthouse, it town is beautiful. square. I love the words up there. In God we trust. You've got to. You are in a Bible belt. I am in the Bible. <laughs> I grew up in it. I grew up in the church. Right now, you're taking me where? to the Heron Farm. This is where they uh, said Greg was when there was shooting going on. Give it some gas and let's get on up that hill. (laughs) They found shell casings on the property here that seemingly matched the murder weapon. How do we know there was shooting here? The neighbor said that they heard shooting here. So they made that phone call at like 2.30 in the afternoon? Yes, yes, yes. A witness said that he saw Greg between 3 and 4, but that was hours after the neighbor said the shooting stopped and police had already cleared the scene. That weekend that they are saying that Greg was here, he was actually in a guard duty in uh, Gordonsville. Now his records can show that, Uh that he was there. His sergeant and other officers confirmed he was there though, right? Yes, yes. Then when he got home, Keith and his girlfriend at that time, Kay, they can both tell you that Greg was at the trailer park Mm -hmm. that afternoon. So he had a proven alibi elsewhere. Right. I know for a fact that Greg Lance could not have been at the Heron Farm around 2.30 on that day shooting because I got home from work about 2.30. He was not there shooting. He was right there at the house talking to Keith. When I first looked at this, what intrigued me was that the puzzle pieces didn't fit. There were just too many things that were unanswered. So when Joyce asked me if I would help with Greg's case, I could not let her just try to get through this on her own. We wanted her help because we did not understand the legal jargon in order to get a new trial. We talked to witnesses. We really started to take a deep dive into what went on here in Putnam County. We have found out that lots of witnesses against Greg were either offered a deal to get out of criminal charges or in some way threatened. Greg had made the mistake of hiring 
people that had a past, had records. Greg would hire people that needed help with money because he was the type that would give the shirt off of his back. He moved Keith in to his home because Keith was living in his car eating out of trash cans when he met Greg. So when investigators started questioning him and putting pressure on these people, then they started saying, well, Greg may have done this or Greg might have done that. Can you talk to us a little bit about the kind of people that Greg had surrounded himself with? Yeah, a number of the folks had certain vulnerabilities that made them easy to lean on them and threaten them. Rocky Harmon, as soon as he testified, wrote Greg a number of letters saying, I'm so sorry I did that. They were pressuring me, I was scared. But then Rocky, since sadly, is deceased, but I spoke to his brother and his brother was like, he was terrified because the police barged into his house and threatened him. Then you had Mike Snow. He was incarcerated at the time. Police took a statement from him, and then they immediately released him once he gave the statement. Keith was kind of a weak person. Bob Croft, the TBI agent, and Keith were doing a whole lot of talking. Keith would say things that he wanted to hear because they were telling him he was a suspect. Interviewing witnesses is a tricky affair. You don't put words in the person's mouth. They have to tell you their own recollection. And I know that every one of the investigators who investigated this were men of integrity. I don't think that Keith believed Greg had killed anybody. They had this piece of rope and they made Keith believe it was the rope that he used to hang in a tree to put firecrackers on. He believed the rope wrapped around the gun was the rope that he had hung in the tree. Six years after Greg is convicted, Keith attempts to prove to himself that the cord that was found on the murder weapon is the same cord that he and Greg had used to tie up fireworks. This reenactment was entirely my idea. I went out and bought these firecrackers myself. I found the exact string. Uh, different color. Just different color. He talked about how he did a bunch of different tests on it. Woo, buddy. Strung it up in the tree and let the firecrackers off. Doesn't look anything like the burn mark that was on the rope of the gun. The rope that was at the trial was just covered in those little tiny burns. My firecrackers did not put those black marks on it. I don't want to so, be guilty of perjury, but I was incorrect. That ain't it. Wasn't my, wasn't my string. Finding out that it couldn't be his cord that was wrapped around the gun devastated him. I didn't have a burn mark, so I did him wrong. Greg had surrounded himself with people who had complicated pasts. He believed in people. And one by one, they all rolled on him and then apologized or changed their stories. But, you, you know, in the court, you can't do that. It's not like in church where you can apologize and then it's over. If you mess up in the court system and someone goes to prison for your mistake. You can't fix it. The impact of this reaches so far beyond just Greg. And so we're gonna go hang out with Joyce again at her house and meet Greg's daughter, Rebecca. So how often do you guys get to talk to Greg? Well, whenever he calls, he's been calling almost every day for the past two or three weeks. This call is from a correction facility and is subject to monitoring and recording. Hello? Hi, Daddy. Hi, hey, sweetheart. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, too. <laughs> I love you, Daddy. Mwah. I love you, too, sweetheart. <laughs>
There's someone here who would really like to speak with you. Hi, Greg. This is Hillary. Hi, <laughs> Hillary. I have been digging into your situation. The state's case is that, yeah, you were getting foreclosed on and you were furious and and so you murdered them and set the house on fire. There's no way, shape, or form or fashion that I've met this crime. Have you interacted with anybody else who had knowledge of the crime while you've been there? Yeah, they brought the military court in. That was in November of uh, 1999. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was walking around. Uh, he went, like that. And, yeah. Uh, and I was like, what? And he said, uh, he said, your name Greg Lance? And I said, yeah. He, he said, I know you didn't kill those people. But he knew who did it. Uh, he told me that uh, Sam Horn was the real killer. Who is Sam Horn? Sam Horn. Uh, he lived across the road from the victim's house. Just like Greg, Sam and Peggy Horn owed money to Victor. They also had purchased their property from Victor on uh, owner financing. They were way behind on their payments. So they were next in line to be foreclosed on. So Philly seemed fairly convinced that Sam Horn was the killer. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. And is that when you were awaiting trial? Right. Was he ever called in during the trial to testify to that? No, the court did not allow, ever allow the jury to hear any evidence against that court. <sighs> the judge ruled that there was nothing to substantiate Billy's testimony, and therefore he did not allow the jury to hear it. Here we have Billy Clayhorn telling us that Sam Horn killed Victor and Alla. How do you get that before the court for them to hear? Through her investigation, Joyce found some people who knew the Horns. Sam and Peggy Horn were said to be the local meth dealers in Putnam County. Victor had threatened Sam and told him that if you don't catch the payments up on the mortgage, I'm going to call law enforcement and advise them that you're cooking meth over here. The late 90s, the, the influx of methamphetamines in our area uh, was huge because it was just cheap and easy money. Uh, It was like the new drug, and a lot of people weren't educated about it. It's all taking its toll on the community. The Horns ran a meth lab in their kitchen, and they were known in Cookville as the Murder Clan, which should tell you something. Wow. Yeah. We spoke to multiple witnesses who all knew Sam and Peggy Horn pretty well. And they told us that Sam and Peggy were over there at the Klesnikov's house the night it happened. That's nuts. Joyce hires an investigator, and they've collected statements from multiple people who knew the Horns. On November 26, 1999, Paula Wakamori gave a statement that she heard Sam Horn made the statement he was going to kill the foreigners. Jackie Clegghorn gave a statement that Sam said that the best way to kill someone is to tape a flashlight to a gun and they cannot see you when you shoot them. Billy said that Samantha Horn, who is the daughter of Sam and Peggy Horn, saw her parents on the night of the murders and they came back from across the street and that they both smelled of gasoline. On June 14th, 2006, Paul Wakamori gave a statement. Samantha stated that her mom went over to the residence and killed those people. Billy Claycorn heard Peggy say she left her blouse over there and she was afraid law enforcement was going to be able to tie it back to her. Chris Henry was a friend of Sam's. Asked if he had ever shot a Tech 9. Chris Henry's response at that time was, not only have I shot a Tech 9, I shot Sam's Tech 9. 
I have spoken to quite a few people in Sam and Peggy Horn's circle, and they've all pretty much told me the same story. It's a real killer still out there. This is gorgeous. It is beautiful. So do you want to show me the Kalishnikau property first? Sure, I'd love to. That's where the house was. So directly in front of us, we have what was the Kalishnikau property, which went up in flames three o'clock in the morning. Right here, where we're seeing it from, is the driveway to the Horn House, which sat right past those bushes. This is so, so close. Yes. They're coming outside. <laughs> I'm Hillary. Hi, How Hillary. are you? Good. When I spoke with you before, you were telling me about the horns yeah. making meth out there. Were they still here when you guys moved in? Yeah, not for long. <laughs> Did you take over ownership of that part? No, I was with the drug task force. You were? So were they on your radar? Oh, yeah. And was it commonly known that they were involved in the, the business? Well, the guys at the drug task force. Uh-huh. So you think perhaps they were making meth in your barn? I told one of my friends with a drug dog, and he said, there's some stuff in there, I'm not putting in there. Did you ever hear about any involvement on their end with what happened here at the Kalishnik house? And one weekend, I did a wiretap with... Uh, Bob Krausick, TBI. Yeah. He told me a bunch of stuff, but they thought they had their guy. Yeah. So the horns were on police radar. They were well known to law enforcement. I don't understand why the path of least resistance wasn't explored. They just tunnel visioned in on Greg. You know, it's just amazing how difficult it is to get a wrong made right. I'm Jessica Van Dyke. I'm executive director and lead counsel at the Tennessee Innocence Project. We became involved in Greg's case. We felt like we could move the case forward. In Tennessee, the only remaining options to him would be a DNA testing petition or a fingerprint testing petition. We were pretty much at the end of the line unless we discovered some new evidence. I got very aggressive in sending out Freedom of Information Act letters. And so in 2015, I got the records from the Bomb and Arson Division in Nashville. And lo and behold, inside of that packet of records was a receipt for a shirt that was found on a picnic table at the Kalisnik House home by their son, I'm pretty certain that this shirt was the shirt that Peggy left over there at the scene. And that blouse could be a critical piece of evidence in this case. It could potentially corroborate the testimony by a witness who said one of the alternate suspects that they left their blouse behind. And so maybe someone else really did this. So if we are able to test this evidence, and if it does support Greg's claim of innocence, then we would be asking a court to vacate his conviction, and the state would then have the option to either go forward with a new trial, or alternatively, they could just miss the charges and he would go free. Greg's new legal team is working very hard to clear his name, but in cases like his, where there is already a conviction, it's an uphill battle. I found a circuit court judge here in Cookville who was willing to talk to me about that. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Come on in. It seems impossible to overturn a wrongful conviction. It is, it is really hard because there's such a presumption that the uh, jury got it right. Many times there were wrongful convictions, you know, especially where you have a high minority population. Um, we don't really have that in the Upper Cumberland. 
I would stack our jurors up against anybody in the country. There's been some really tough decisions that the jurors have made, and I think they've got it right every time. As we've dug deeper into this case, you have all these pods of people, and they all clash in this story. You've got the Kalishnikows and the Horns and all the members of the trailer park. And the collision of those separate groups is tragic. These murders changed my life and Becky's life and Keith's and definitely Greg's. Cookville was a really small town. When I would go anywhere near anyone, they were looking at me like they thought I was involved in it. It was really hard. I mean, I lost custody of my kids. Uh, it was more than I could handle. Keith testified against somebody that he cared a lot about and believed that something happened that did not happen. And he really had a hard time living with that. And he worked hard at drinking himself to death. My daddy's been locked up for 22 years, and I'll be 22 this August. Oh, honey, that's a long time. I've never seen him outside of prison. I want to see my daddy. You deserve that. You do. As much as Joyce wants answers and I want answers, Greg wants answers, I'm sure the, the victim's family would like to have the answers. There are a lot of missing pieces to this puzzle, and we all have a right to know the truth. I cannot definitively say, yes, this other person did it. What I can say is that until that evidence testing happens, has justice really been served? When Deanie was missing, I would pray real hard and ask God, help us find Deanie. Show us where he is. I'm not a psychic. I'm not crazy. But God kind of showed me a picture in my mind of a river, of muddy water, with weeds sticking up in it. I was scared to death. <laughs> made my way out here to Shelby County. It is a very rural community out here in Kentucky. And you've got these little teeny tiny jewel box towns and it's just beautiful. And there's life on the water. There's rivers, there's lakes, you know, fishing and being outdoors. It's like a really nice, quiet life. And that's why it's really shocking when Obviously, when something terrible happens. I've lived here for many years. All in all, it's just a nice, peaceful town and good people. Rural communities, the individuals take care of each other. They truly watch out for each other. They um, are supportive in law enforcement. I don't worry about somebody breaking in on me or anything. I'm just a country girl. You gotta be free. Open up doors, open up your windows, let it all hang out. Back in 1998, a 40 year old man named Kyle Dean Brayton, uh, who went by Deanie, he was a really loved member of the community. 
And so when he went missing, there was a lot of heartache in the town here. And when his body showed up, everyone was devastated. Everybody in town was pointing the finger at everybody else. And so they could never nail down a suspect. It became a cold case. And it was really important to this community that they find out who did it and they get justice for Danny. And I don't know that he, the killer for Danny will ever be held accountable. I'm going to meet with Susan King, who lives here in rural Kentucky. She, probably more than anybody, can give us insight as to what went wrong in this case. Hello? Susan? Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hi. I got a cold, wet paw. No, you're fine. It's hot out here. No, this it's is hot out here. gorgeous. Here, you got a hair up place because I'm a hair. You're a hairdresser. I'm a retired hairdresser. You're gonna fix me. You're in charge of making me look cute today. <laughs> How did you know Danny Braden? I went to high school with Danny. Oh, okay. And he was so cute, and he was so funny and so handsome, and he was just hilarious. His personality. Yeah. Oh. Him and his buddies, they were bad. <laughs> Fun ones are sometimes. <laughs> After school, I went my way, and he was doing plumbing with his father's business. Okay. And then it was in 1996, I think, that he came over with a cousin, and I hadn't seen him in a years and years and years. Mm -hmm. So we ended up going out that night. Next thing you know, we were together. Were you guys on or off when Deanie went missing? We were off. I broke up with Deanie about three months before he went missing. The last day that anyone saw Kyle Dean Breeden was on October 26th of 1998, and he didn't show up for work the next day. I don't think anyone actually suspected any sort of foul play or that anything had happened to him. I think people had thought that he must have just been out partying or just out having fun and that he's going to turn up sooner or later. He goes missing. How do you find out about it? His mom called me and wanted to know if Danny was at my house. And I said, no, I haven't seen him in about three weeks. The more time that passed, I think the more concerned people got some of his friends and a bunch of my friends. We would get together early every morning and we'd try to find him. We looked everywhere. My whole church was praying for Danny. And I can pray, and sometimes God answers you, you know. Yeah, I know. I told him, I said, Lord, we need help finding him. Show me where he's at. And what he showed me was a, a river. The water was muddy and it was rushing by with a lot of weeds sticking up at the bank. On November 5th of 1998, two fishermen were fishing in the Kentucky River and they found a body floating in the river near the reeds. And it ends up being Kyle Dean Breeden. We all came across the news about a body they found in the river and the phone rang and it was his oldest brother. It was just a terrible thing. The way his mom and dad suffered, it was devastating to everybody. It's a lot to shoulder when it's people that you've known your whole life. This was the absolute worst case scenario for a small town in Kentucky. The Kentucky State Police took lead of the investigation as soon as they found the body. My name is Todd Harwood. I spent 21 years with the Kentucky State Police. When Cal Breeden's body was floating in the Kentucky River, the body presented evidence of bloating, which means that the body had been there for some time, and there was a guitar amplifier cord wrapped around his legs. Two gunshot wounds were found to the head. It was very apparent that this was a victim of some type of foul play, and once detectives picked up the breed investigation, their next task is to canvas the community. Initially, they only had a body. They didn't have any sort of eyewitness. So the state police start interviewing all of his friends and family to see when he was last seen, if they can put together a timeline. We know that at 10 a.m., he was at a bank 
obtaining a $250 loan. Between 2 and 3 p.m., he retrieved a fishing pole from a pawn shop. Who was the last person that had seen Deanie? Probably his killer was the last person he saw. I thought it was his drug dealer. One of them. He had many. I definitely thought it had something to do with drugs. Was the drug scene big here? Yes. Over in Shelbyville? It's terrible. Really? Awful. What are the drugs of choice? Danny used crack cocaine. That's what got him. Danny was a great guy. He really was. Right before your very eyes, he went from the funny, sweet, smiling Danny, and you could see his face change. He looked like a completely different person. Yeah. I tried my best to make Danny quit that stuff. I gave him the choice, me or the drugs. I thought I was so pretty and so sweet and so nice that he would choose me. Yeah. And he didn't. He would often go into different towns and purchase drugs. He would often borrow money to do so. He would ask for money because he had people hounding him to pay him back. Nobody really knew these people's names. That he would ever come to a bad end. Did that ever cross your mind? Yes, it did. Then he lived a dangerous life when he was using. I knew he was dealing with some people that were bad news, probably. Something that the police were able to determine is that Kyle seemed a little bit scared leading up to his death. He would ask people to pray for him. I was afraid for his life the whole time I was with him because those people don't fool around. And everybody was afraid that something was going to happen. This main street is beautiful. Here, straight from Kentucky, a hometown show. Oh, look, a meet and greet with the Shelbyville Police Department. They have food, family-friendly activities. It's dare. Alive and well in Shelbyville. Small towns have been dealing with the drug epidemic for decades, especially in the 90s when Danny Breeden died. And so people in this community wondered, was he murdered by a local drug dealer or was it somebody else entirely? How do you go to church? How do you go to the supermarket not knowing who your friend's killer is? He was purchasing crack on a daily basis. Any drug dealer in that rural community was immediately suspected as being part of his death, being some type of a drug transaction gone bad. That sent a whole list of suspects. We knew that he had an inner circle, individuals that he was close to, his family, friends, that was a list of suspects. The original investigators on the case beat the streets. They interviewed a ton of individuals. But the problem is they were running in circles. Because Cal Breeden was well known in the Shelbyville community, rumor and innuendo can affect all facets of an investigation, such as this, when individuals know about each other, care about each other, they may not be as forthcoming with information. Oh, everybody was suspicious of everybody. Deanie's parents wanted to know what happened to their son. It was heartbreaking. Small town rumor mill and word on the street really complicated this investigation. It seems like for every member of Shelbyville, there was a theory on who could have committed this crime. So I am off to meet Lauren Nichols, who is an attorney in Louisville, and she had gotten very heavily involved in this case. And I think she has a really good grasp of who all the players are. How long after the murder does it sit there? For seven years, it goes unsolved. What happens that kind of changes everything? In May of 2006, the Kentucky State Police assigned the case to Detective Harwood, and he ran with it. I did not get involved in the Breed investigation until May of 2006. My sergeant at the time asked me if I would look at several particular cold cases and see if I could make headway with them. The breeding investigation was one of those. I work sometimes 16, 18 hour days beating the streets of Shelbyville, Kentucky. The first place I like to go to is barbershops, bars, and preachers. 
anybody that I could talk to, many individuals had reported that drug dealers were somehow involved in Deanie Breeden's disappearance. But when you talk to these individuals, every single one of them said the same thing, that any time he would get in debt or have financial issues, his mother would bail him out. Why do we want to take out the person when we know we're always going to get paid? So I had to look at the other individuals in this case. So Detective Harwood goes through the suspect list and pretty early on, he narrows in on Susan King, the on and off again girlfriend. Susan King was always a suspect. The original investigator actually went to her residence and was able to obtain a brief, limited interview with her. This is probably in 1999 and observed bullet holes on the floor of Susan King's residence at the time period. Investigators approached the Commonwealth attorney for a search warrant. He indicated there was not enough evidence at that time to move forward with a search warrant. Detective Harwood thinks that it's very suspicious that the police officer saw before that there were two bullet holes in her floor. And that was in the previous officer's notes? Yes. Working in rural communities, especially cold cases, a lot of times you know who did it. You know how they did it. But proving is another story. Susan and Deanie had a history of domestic violence. They would kind of beat up on each other. Was she the aggressor in those situations? She says no. She says that she would do whatever it took to defend herself, but that she was not typically the aggressor. Well, my relationship with Deanie was good one day and bad the next, because when he wasn't on drugs, he was a great person to be around. But then when Deanie get on the drugs, then yeah, he'd come home and, and he'd hit me and stuff. Don't like fighting, but I don't like to be mistreated. When I looked into Susan King as a suspect, I found at least three individuals that she had put a gun to their head threatening to kill them on separate instance. And one of those identified a 22 caliber weapon, the same type that Kyle Deany Breeden was killed with. The case was reopened on May 22nd, uh-huh. and by June 12th, he already has a search warrant. <laughs> we pulled back the carpet. The first thing we see is four bullet holes. They lift the floor out. We immediately find that there's a 22 caliber round lodged in one of the bullet holes in that piece that we lifted out. What I think happened is Cal Dini Breed gets to Susan King's residence, a domestic argument ensues, and I think Susan King finally made good on those threats and shot Cal Dini Breeden right there in her residence. Detective Harwood, after his investigation concluded, he put together a list of why he thought Susan King was the murderer. So oh, yeah, here's his indictment request. Oh, this is it. He calls it the big break, where they observed bullet holes in her floor. In one of the holes, there was male human DNA. And then Susan was an avid guitar player. By the time that Detective Harwood is doing this investigation, she owned an electric guitar. The victim was found with a guitar amplifier cord wrapped around his legs. In a subsequent search warrant, we found inside her residence guitar amplifier cords. Did they ever find any DNA on the amplifier cord that would have tied her to it? No. You can have a lot of circumstantial evidences. You don't have to have a smoking gun. Okay. And so the fact that she was a fisherman and had experience fishing in and around the Kentucky River in the Gratz area, he was found at a place that she had previously fished before, was significant to him. It was April of 2007. This case was finally presented before the Spencer County Grand Jury. I'm Thomas Clay. I'm an attorney and I do criminal defense work as well as plaintiff's civil work. Nine years after the homicide, the grand jury returns an indictment for murder. 
Well, the problem with that is that there was exculpatory evidence which tends to prove that Susan King was innocent, which was withheld, such as Susan King was involved in an automobile accident that resulted in the loss of her leg. And not just a little bit of it. Her wound required them to amputate her leg up into her hip. Susan was confined to crutches. None of that was presented to the grand jury. That wasn't part of their consideration in indicting her. The allegations against her were that this 98-pound woman who is disabled somehow or another murdered a 200-pound man and then take his body, drag him down several flights of steps, bind his body, put his body into the trunk of a car, and then throw him over a bridge. It's very apparent that this woman could not physically have committed this murder that she's in jail for having committed. They get to the point where the case is either going to have to go to trial or there's going to be a negotiated resolution. I didn't have money for an attorney. You know, my family, they're comfortable, but just your average person doesn't have millions of dollars to give to a lawyer. So I thought, well, I didn't do it, so it ought, ought to be pretty easy to prove. So they appointed me a public defender. My lawyer said they were going to try to get the death sentence. And then they come back a little bit later and they said if I would admit to it, I could get life instead of death. I didn't want to plead guilty that day. Sitting in jail, waiting on a trial, she's told our wheels of justice are really slow. It's at least two years for you to get a trial. And then if a jury convicts you, you have at least 25 years. She trusted what people were telling her. She's scared, and she thinks the best thing for herself is to take a plea deal. But Susan is insistent that she's innocent. And so she wants to take what's called an Alfred plea. An Alfred plea allows a defendant to go in front of a judge and say, Judge, I didn't commit this crime. However, I recognize that the evidence against me, the prosecution has, is sufficient to convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt that I'm guilty. Susan would have been looking at about 25 years if she was convicted of murder. Uh -huh. Part of the Alfred deal was it would be down to a 10-year maximum sentence, but that she would be eligible for, for parole after six months. Oh, that's a no-brainer. Right. Susan wanted to do whatever it was going to take to get going with her life again. At the time she entered that plea of guilty, she had served enough time in jail already to be eligible for parole. The parole board expected her to acknowledge she had committed this crime, and Susan King never, ever admitted she had done this crime. The irony of the whole situation is that the parole board said that she didn't show enough remorse. But she said she didn't do it. Right. And so they said, you don't seem remorseful for your crime, so now you have to serve out, which is 10 years. Susan says, wait a minute, this is not the deal that I signed up for. On the surface, the Alfred plea makes sense because you are maintaining your innocence and it's your way out. In Susan's case, they hold that against her. So what's the right move? It's impossible to figure that out. It's hard to explain what happens to you in prison, what happens to your mind. It was the awfulest place that you could ever imagine. The meanest people you ever want to deal with. People I didn't even know could be that mean. And those are the ones that worked there. Girls ganged up on me and were kicking me in the ribs and stuff. And all I could do was ball up in the corner of that cell. You just ball up in a ball and cry. So this is the vantage point with this bridge dump. Yeah, 10 years before, they demolished the old bridge. Did the other bridge also have a retaining wall like this one? Yeah. The state's whole theory of the case is that Susan was able to obtain a car, mm -hmm. drive up here, all on crutches, park the car on the bridge, and get a 200-pound body over this retaining wall. You think if the grand jury heard that 
she only had one leg and how much she weighed, they would have gone for it. Knowing her physical condition at the time of the murder, I didn't believe it. Yeah. I didn't weigh about 100 pounds and I didn't have but one leg. And anybody with a right mind wouldn't think that I'd do all the things Harwood said I did. It's my understanding that a 98-pound person with one leg is capable of pulling a trigger on a firearm and capable of pulling it multiple times. What I think occurred after that, Susan employed some help to move that body from her residence. Could she have utilized the Gratz Bridge to roll the body off into the water? Absolutely. She could have also disposed of a body utilizing a boat. Both of those are theories. We can't prove either or. I was in law school in 2010, and I was doing an internship with the Innocence Project. And I was assigned Susan's case. How old were you? 22. She's my first client. She's my first case. And our job is to see if there's an actual potential that this woman could be innocent. If there's anything there, then the Innocence Project will run with it. But if there isn't, then they've done their duty in terms of looking into the case. What was your first meeting with her like? I distinctly remember her saying to me, honey, I'm not a saint, but I'm not a murderer. I didn't do this. And it was eating her up that the real killer was out there somewhere. I spent hundreds of hours over the course of 18 months digging through all of the facts and all of the evidence. What did you guys uncover? One of the most interesting things was listening to the grand jury tape and realizing that Detective Harwood glossed over the fact that the ballistics were definitively not a match. The Kentucky State Police lab reports indicated conclusively that the bullet fragments found in her floor with those bullet holes did not match the bullets that were found in his head. It was a 22 Magnum versus a 22 Long. Detective Harwood says they're all 22s, and then when asked about testing, he says, oh, it's inconclusive because they're degraded. When you fire a bullet, there's lands and grooves on a bullet that can connect that to the firearm that produced the bullet. But because a 22 caliber, it's a small and soft shell because of deformation, you can't do that. Harwood said they couldn't be compared but they were compared and they were different. So that's a substantial mischaracterization. If the grand jury had been told the truth there and that those bullets did not match, it's very likely they wouldn't have returned an indictment and we wouldn't even be sitting here today. There was bullet holes in that house when I bought it, but I put a couple of them in there myself. I was at home one day and this motorcycle comes up my driveway. The sky's on it. And he just walked right in my house, drunk as he could be. And I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'll come to see you. And then he got getting closer to me and started touching me and things. And I got scared. So I had a pistol. But I pulled it out and I told him, I said, you need to leave now. He said, oh, no, baby. And so I, I put two holes in the floor and one in the ceiling and he left. Detective Harwood makes a big point of the fact there was male human DNA, but he took that portion of her floor eight years after Kyle Breeden was murdered. It could have been anybody's. Oh, all right. So his next point is that Susan played the guitar. His body was found with a guitar amplifier cord wrapped around his legs. And she plays electric guitar? Susan says that she played an acoustic guitar and only got an electric guitar after his death. His next point is that she was a fisherman. In a river community, is it rare for a woman to fish? No, I don't think it's rare for a woman to fish. Okay. You know, there's a lot of people in this world like to fish and like to play guitar. That don't mean they murdered somebody. It doesn't mean that you need to get accused of something they didn't do we determined that there was not 
really a shred of evidence to make us think that Susan actually committed this murder. We couldn't find anybody that would serve as an accomplice. So what happens next? Unfortunately, from a legal perspective, to be able to overturn any sort of conviction, okay. we have to have new evidence. The fact that evidence didn't exist isn't enough to get somebody out of jail. We had the tall task of sitting down with her and telling her that we believe you're innocent. We believe you didn't commit this murder, but we don't have any new evidence that's needed to exonerate you. What'd she say? That was a really hard conversation. She cried. She cried. A lot. It was hard. But she honestly, she thanked us. She said, you're one of the only people that believe me. You're one of the only people that knows I didn't commit this crime and that actually believes me and that's going to have to be enough. Jeez. And at that point, I graduated and I began practicing law. And it was pretty disheartening, to be honest, to realize you're going into a profession that um, is supposed to be promoting justice and my first case is an obvious injustice. Then, about a year later, I get a call from the director of the Innocence Project, and I'm told, are you sitting down? We have new evidence in Susan's case. I never heard of Susan King's name until May 3rd in 2012. My name is Baron Morgan, and I was a narcotics detective with Louisville Metro Police Department. I got a call that was a shooting at a location I was investigating. The suspect, his name was Richard Jarrell. He was in, in the drug business for a while. I just wanted to know why was he shooting at this particular house. But then that conversation, he stopped and said, look here, detective, my brother got arrested for 22 kilos of cocaine. He said, if you can help my brother out, I will tell you about the first murder I committed. He said, this guy's name was Denny Breeden. It's 2012. Susan is five years into a sentence for manslaughter for the death of Danny Breeden. And all of a sudden, somebody else comes forward with a totally different story to tell. And we appreciate you talking to us, so. The dude that I killed, his name was Dean. Did we call him Dean? I don't know him real well. Yeah. I know he sold $20 for me. I interviewed a lot of people in my life. When uh, Rich Jarrell told me this story, he didn't skip a beat. I believed him. I tell him uh, I'm gonna pick him up. And it was my birthday, remember I said it was my birthday. And I was like, oh, my dad's gonna get my money, you know. Richard told Breeden that he was gonna take him to his father's house to uh, get high. But on the way there, they stopped at a check cashing place. Breeden got some money out and then they drove to this house. So we get out of the car and I start putting the jacket on where I got this 22. Well, he walks up to the fence and I blow his brains out. How many times did you shoot? Just two. Yeah. And I wrestle this fat piece <laughs> into the trunk of his car. I get him tied up with these uh, guitar like uh, cords, like you put them to the amplifier. He drove Breeden to the grass bridge, took him out of the car, and the way he was describing it, you could tell that he was relive reliving the case. And I popped the trunk, wrestled this piece of down the trunk of the car. I put his fat ass up on the thing, yeah. and the bricks fell off. Yeah. I let him go anyways. All down into the water, and it was gone. Every little piece that I couldn't figure out fit perfectly in this confession tape. The day that he was last seen, Dini went that morning and cashed a $250 check and that there was somebody in the car, but nobody knew who that was. Well, Richard Jarrell talks about going and getting the check cashed earlier that day. Nuh-uh. Oh yes, he was the unknown person in he the car. He was the guy in the car! Try to remember the, the bank he went to. What about it? And what city do you think it was in? It was in Shelbyville. It was in Shelbyville. Yeah. The most compelling thing of all 
Richard Jarrell says, I actually killed him as a birthday gift to myself. Look, it's my birthday. I'm going to kill this motherfucker. For the 20 bucks, I mean, because he ripped you off. Right, and it was my birthday. So when I look it up, this man's 21st birthday was the day that he was last seen. And that's far too much of a coincidence to be able to just make up. 14 years later. That's nuts. The scary thing about it, though, watching him tell that story, he went deep. And he was enjoying it. And he told me at the end, I think I got done talking to him, he was like, I felt so good. I knew that we got a bad guy we need to put away. We got an uh, innocent person in prison we need to get out. Baron Morgan did four things. Number one, you keep your chain of command informed. You notify the Commonwealth's attorney. You notify the prosecutor. And you notify the Kentucky State Police. I made a call to the state police. And for some reason, we couldn't get them to come out that night. I spoke with the Commonwealth Attorney Office in Jefferson County, and we agreed to contact the Innocent Project. I was sitting in prison one day, scrubbing the toilet, and they called my name over the speaker. I'm like, now what? Now what am I in trouble for? Of course, they strip searched me, and then they put me in the visiting room, and in came uh, three, looked like angels, and said they were with the Innocence Project, and that they had some news for me. And I said, well, I could use some good news. And they said, Susan, a man has confessed to killing Feeney. He knew things nobody else would have known. Boy, my head went down on that table and I cried and cried and cried and cried. I said, maybe everybody will believe me now. We took the confession tape and were able to piece it together with all of the evidence that we had. At that point, we couldn't work fast enough. It was working day and night to put together a motion to get it before the court to say, here's the new evidence that we need. There's an innocent woman sitting in our jail system. How do we get her out? I remember getting a phone call late at night from a Louisville investigator saying that they had an individual that they arrested on an attempted murder charge that was wanting to confess to the Deany Breeden investigation. Gerald was an enigma. He was never mentioned in the case report. There was just nothing in any way, shape, or form to connect him with Kyle Denny Breeden with the exception of Gerald's statement. Detective Harwood, he comes up to Louisville and he interviews Richard Jarrell. I asked Gerald point blank, are you full of I wanted to know. And he even said it, I'm full of And admitted to me that he was being deceptive because he wanted to help out his brother. Detective Harwood goes and does an interview with Mr. Gerald, and at that point, Mr. Gerald withdraws his confession. The problem for us is that nobody really knows what was said in that interview, except for the fact that immediately after, Richard Gerell recants his entire confession. Detective Harwood says he recorded the conversation, but that tape was immediately stolen out of KSP's locked evidence file. I had five digital recorders. I cannot account for the recorder itself. It was lost in the process. Um, it has still not been found today, and it was obviously a huge mistake in the investigation. The confession has been recanted. What does that do to Susan's chances of getting out? It becomes a credibility issue. Was he telling the truth then, when he confessed to the crime, or is he telling the truth now, when he says, I didn't do it. So the prosecutor says to us, I'm going to let the judge decide. At this point, we have a long hearing, mm -hmm. and we present all the evidence to the judge. Mr. Jarrell comes, and he pleads the fifth. So we play the confession tape. Well, he walks up to the fence, blow his brains out. And then ultimately, the judge rules there's overwhelming evidence of innocence, but he procedurally thinks that because she took a plea, 
rather than have let it gone on to a jury trial, he can't do anything legally. But her plea was to maintain her innocence. Right. Had this new piece of evidence existed, would she still have taken that plea? Because it's a technicality again. It is. It's a technicality. One of the procedural problems with this was that the motion they filed under the rule they used required there to be a trial. Well, there was no trial. So the judge concluded, since there wasn't a trial, I'm not going to allow you to withdraw your plea. And Susan had to remain in prison. When I got back from court that day, the officers had already packed up all my stuff. They thought I was going home. They couldn't believe that I had to stay in there after that confession. But it did. Susan had already served out her time. And so at this point, it's clearing her name. Eventually, the Court of Appeals agreed with us. This procedurally can't stand. This shouldn't be the law of Kentucky. It was a manifest miscarriage of justice to allow this innocent woman to sit in jail. And so Susan's Alfred plea is removed from the record, and she's deemed innocent. This is not an exoneration. This is an individual that has been given a new trial. However, you have to look at the case. And if we take this before a jury, one of them is going to believe Richard Jarrell or put enough credence to found her not guilty. Susan King was the victim of a flawed prosecution, a prosecution that Todd Harwood was responsible for. I think there might have been an attitude that the ends justify the means. He wanted to solve this case and put this murder on somebody, and the person he selected as a target was Susan King. So Susan came to me to represent her in the civil action against the Kentucky State Police and Harwood. Who is the civil suit against? Todd Harwood himself. And what was the basis of your claim? Malicious prosecution. That means he put me through hell that he shouldn't have. Lost all my animals. And I lost my cosmetology degree. No, you lost your house. You lost your career, your friends. And time with my family. And mentally, it just tears you to pieces going through something like this. I'll never get over it. I'm so thankful that I got enough money in my settlement to buy a home. But see, I had a home, and it was paid for. And that's why one reason I settled out of court. I didn't have to have millions to make me happy, but I did need enough money to get me back what I had. I'm hoping it'll have some impact on how they handle wrongful convictions from now on. When I heard that Susan King was vindicated, and she was no longer a convicted murderer, made my day. But the police department, they didn't want to admit that they made a mistake. After I gave them the audio tape of the confession, state police weren't that happy with me. Matter of fact, my chief of police and a couple more majors, they were pretty upset with me. I guess I crossed that blue line. When he disclosed this stuff, it reflected adversely upon KSP. So he was subjected to retaliation. He was assigned to basically an entry-level patrolman's job. That was his reward for bringing forth the truth on what had happened to Susan King. So then, at that point, we filed a whistleblower complaint against the Louisville Metro Police Department. There is so much loss in this story. There is Susan King, who lost her whole livelihood, her house. And there's Baron Morgan, whose career was derailed and whose stellar reputation was tarnished. But 
the thing that gets lost is that Deanie lost his life. He's the victim, and no one has ever been convicted of his murder. To hear Jarrell like laugh and casually talk about throwing a man's body, a man who he murdered for fun, according to him, in this spot, this like beautiful spot, it just, it's unhinged. There's no justice. Yeah. 